This is Twit. Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, wherever you might be. This is Chibert, and we're doing another of our at Quiet Afternoon specials. So this is segment 2A. We're solving VoIP, or unif unif Unified Communications, drops and clipping problems this time. And again, this is Tim Titus with pa CTO of Pass Solutions, and we're going to take each segment in turn and dive into the most common problems you're going to start seeing if you're dealing with a VoIP infrastructure. So, Tim, let's dive in. What does a drop or a clipping problem actually sound like? Well, a, a drop or clipping problem typically sound I, it. I'm missing phrases in it. So I think everyone's familiar with that sort of sound. That's what it sounds like. People get frustrated because you you're only getting half of the words, missing words, uh, 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 words that are clipped off. And so that's something that I think everyone has encountered because uh, uh, VoIP and UC drops and clipping, this is the number one problem that folks have in the world of VoIP. And so, okay, what causes this kind of thing? Most simply, packet loss. So networks have developed to be very... Uh, uh, able to handle a lot of packet loss. You can copy a file and say, gee, this file copy should take 10 seconds. If you drop 10% of the packets, it's going to take 11 seconds. Nobody cares. It'll retransmit and be just fine. You're dropping 10% packets on a voice phone call, it's going to sound horrible because you're missing one out of every 10 words or every 10th word gets clipped. So people get very frustrated about packet loss in a, a real-time protocol environment like VoIP or video, whereas data, people don't care. And so that don't care historic has passed through to the point where now people have to care. You have to groom your network and solve the sources and causes of packet loss. Otherwise, you're just going to end up with call quality issues. So, okay, that's cool. How do you find it? Are there tools within... Most VoIP systems, are there third-party tools? Uh -huh. Well, so most VoIP phone systems, they typically, they walk away from the network and say, hey, it's your problem. you got to find the problem in your network to solve it. Uh, so finding out where the packet loss is coming from, finding out why it's happening. And also the third thing that makes it really difficult is most of these packet loss problems are transient. That means that the problem will happen for a short period of time and then disappear. And probably by the time you end up going to look, by logging into switches, logging into routers, looking around the network, the problem's long gone and you'll never find it until it happens again. Which, if it happens again every hour, great, you might have a chance of finding it. If it happens once or twice a day, yeah, good luck in finding it. You're going to have to stumble across it randomly to actually say, hey, we caught it and we found it. It's on this interface and it's happening because of a bad cable. Yeah, but I don't know about you, but... It's always my boss calls me late at night saying, hey, Brian, my call yesterday at 7 p.m. really stank. Do something about it. Uh, how? <laughs> so let's go through the different causes as to where packet loss can come from. Uh, typically, you have oversubscribed links with no QoS. Imagine if you had a 10 meg link going uh, from Hawaii to San Francisco and you were copying just massive virtual machines from one data center to another across that link. You're gonna flood that link pretty quickly with these data packets. You try and get a voice call in there, you're gonna be dropping a bunch of packets from the voice call, you're gonna be dropping a bunch of packets from the data transfers, but again, the data transfers don't care. They're gonna be retransmitted. The voice phone call, you can't retransmit the RTP packets. You're just gonna have poor call quality. So. If you have a link that is overutilized and you have no QoS, you're kind of at the mercy of what the network gives you. you it's, it's, it's what's called uh, uh, best effort, and you don't want voice ever using best effort. The second thing that can cause packet loss and second most likely place is misconfigurations. Now, what type of misconfigurations can you have on a network? Well, <laughs> the most simple one is a half duplex link or a duplex mismatch. Sadly, these still occur in a lot of networks. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, I was looking at a, a, a company's network, and we found that they had a voice gateway 
that was running a 100 meg half duplex. That's guaranteed to end up giving them call quality problems. And the good news is they were able to get it fixed pretty quickly. Other misconfigurations, you can end up having a voice device associated with the wrong VLAN. If it has the wrong VLAN, you're not going to get the DSCP marking assigned to it. It's not going to be routing the same way as the other voice calls. So making sure that your voice traffic is all segregated onto its own VLAN is important to make sure it's just part of that voice protection that you've set up. Another place you can have packet loss is hardware failures. Number one is cabling faults. Uh, I think we've all heard about uh, the, the person that said, gee, you know, we didn't realize we had cabling problems and still we started looking at cable jackets and they discovered that about half of their cabling was all cat three patch cords that somebody found in a box somewhere and decided to reuse. Honestly, if you see a cable that has cat three on the jacket, it's old enough, it ought to be tossed. And by the way, good practice whenever you toss a cable, cut both ends of the cable off. I've worked for companies before where you just throw a cable in the, uh, in the trash can. Somebody looks and says, oh, a perfectly good cable. They pick it up out of the trash can. They put it back into production, and your problems have just followed you back into the network. If you cut the ends off, then you can't have that happen. Yeah, my favorite is I don't know why telephone companies keep sending off silver satin flat cables with their phones. I, I can't imagine anything worse than that. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. Using the right type of cabling is important. Uh, those silver satin, they should have all been retired long time ago. Uh, so if anyone uses them, it's like you're kind of asking for trouble as far as it's not following the Ethernet standard. Um, other hardware failures, you can have NIC failures. Uh, I think we've all encountered the, the, uh, the, the switch that has a bad port on it. Uh, we've all encountered devices that have a, a bad Ethernet adapter on it. Uh, so there will be failures occasionally happen, and those failures can be the type where the entire network adapter fails. That's fine. You can typically deal with that and just say, let me use a new port. If the adapter half fails, and what I mean by half fails is you can have an Ethernet line driver on an Ethernet adapter end up not being able to have enough power to transmit the distances that you have set up. If you have uh, 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 100 meters to your switch, you're really operating at the, the length, the limitation of, of how far Ethernet can go. If a line driver fails and you're not transmitting at full power, it can't even do that distance. Um, other problems you can have that cause packet loss, you can have device resource limitations. Uh, let's say you had a switch or a router uh, didn't have enough memory or uh, you have improperly assigned packet buffers. Imagine a switch or router that has gobs of memory, but there's only five uh, buffered packets per interface. That means anything over those five packets, it has to discard. So depending upon how much buffering you've defined on interfaces, uh, that can end up changing based upon the amount of resources inside of a device. But again, that number one reason for packet loss is those oversubscribed links with no QoS, and the misconfigurations that you encounter. So, good, good tips. What I think everybody wants to know is, what kinds of things do I need to look for? So, now, what am what are my tools available to me to try and find and solve these bugs? So, there's two real cases. There's being able to find it and being able to resolve it. So, on my slide eight. I have uh, uh, the ways that you use to find the problem. Um, so typically finding the problem, you're, what you're doing is you're looking to confirm that this problem does exist. Now, a call simulator or APM, application performance monitoring, you can use this to say, gee, we do see packet loss between A and B. You're able to confirm that there's packet loss. You can use a, a packet analyzer like Wireshark and confirm and say, yes, we are losing packets between A and B. You might have in your phone system the ability to analyze CDR records, call detail records, and say, yes, this call had packet loss between A and B. So this gives you the ability to confirm and if a user says, hey, I had a poor quality call, you can say, yeah, my call simulator showed that you probably had a poor quality call too. My packet analyzer that was sniffing the call said, yeah, you had a poor quality call. The CDR record says, yes, you had a poor quality call. 
confirming the problem is really only 10% of the problem. And so that's really where a lot of folks get stuck saying, how do I actually solve the problem? Because it could be anywhere between A and B. So let's roll into how do you resolve the problem? So with resolution in mind, what you need to resolve the problem is you need to pull out your network map and you need to identify every link, every switch, every router used between those two VoIP endpoints. Then you need to log into those switches and routers and check all of the interfaces for all of the error counters used along the path. You need to investigate the QoS configuration. So if we look at slide four, um, what we can see here very quickly, so this is the path through the network that this call took. Looking at slide six, what you need to do is investigate every one of these interfaces, every one of these devices for all of the error counters, all of the CPU, memory, health on every one of these involved links, switches, and devices. Now, some people might think, well, wait, doesn't my monitoring software already track these error counters? Sadly, wow, they don't. That's a lot of spreadsheets, man. Oh, well, yeah. It's, well, the problem is monitoring software will ping your switches and routers and tell you if they're up and down. They will tell you about link status. They'll give you some pretty utilization graphs, but they won't tell you about packet loss. In fact, the way to think about it is if you had a single half duplex interface along this path, could your monitoring software find it? And I would argue that most monitoring software packages don't have the ability to find a half duplex interface in a network. They're just not designed to look at that. They can't find a bad cable. They're not looking at the error counters. So as far as useful tools and being able to diagnose these problems, uh, let's look at slide 10. And what slide 10 is gonna show is if you had the right monitoring and the right capability, you'd be able to look into the interfaces, the switches, the routers, all of the error counters to be able to analyze what happened along this path so that you could say the bad call at noon that happened between these earlier in the day is we were dropping 8% of the packets out of the high priority queue on this one router. We had some carrier sense errors on this other router and we had some collisions on this other router. You solve all three of those problems, your call quality problems disappear because you're now solving the root causes of the problems. So this is kind of the difference of, of why is it hard to solve the root cause of the problem? It's that monitoring software doesn't go deep enough and you can look for this manually. You can build out your map, log into these switches, look at the interfaces, look at all of the error counters and find the problem. Uh, or you could look at software, you know, I'll, I'll unabashedly admit this is what our software is designed to do, is help make this easy to give you the root cause answer of these problems. Right, and you know, previously I've, I've done an awful lot of spreadsheets where I have to pull down the errors if I, if I even know where to look, and then yeah. try to line them up on time, and that, that's a lot of work. It, it is, but it's, it's also that you have to know the error counters to pull. And you have to also know how to get the QoS stats off of the boxes because you might have a, a Juniper router, a Cisco router. You can have a number of different devices. And being able to normalize all that data takes a bit of time. But I, I think if we go back to that slide 10, that's the difficulty is that you've got so many places that you can have problems and so many reasons at each of these places you can have problems, this is why it's difficult. And by the way, notice that this path is just one path. If you hang up the phone call and say, gee, that was terrible, and you make the phone call and it takes a different path through the network that's healthy, it might be a perfectly good phone call at that point. So this is what makes it so that people have a lot of challenges saying, well, sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's good, but it's that there's so many moving parts it gets very challenging and monitoring software doesn't go deep enough to answer what's really going on on these link switches or routers. Cool. You know, uh, I, I, I've been using, I'll fess up, I've been using TotalView for quite a while and it has certainly solved an awful lot of my problems. Well, we've made it but, to solve problems for engineers because it's difficult. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, what kinds of other tools, you know, not everybody's going to be able to buy TotalView right now, but what kind of tools 
can we start using to help justify moving towards more advanced tools, I guess is the, you know, the pathway we want to go. How so, do we justify to our boss? So in one sense, that this, uh, I'm going to say you're always going to be good with Wireshark as a confirmation tool. Uh, it's going to be able to confirm that you're dropping packets. The problem then is finding out where those packets are being dropped and why. Uh, if you have uh, a call simulator, that can help narrow it down sometimes to be able to simulate mm -hmm. a phone call halfway across the network and say, let me test just this portion of the network and say, is it stable for half of the network? If it's stable, great. You now can rule that out and say it's not part of the problem. Um, and so having good troubleshooting methodology of let's divide and conquer, find out is the problem in our part of the network or is it in the carrier's part of the network? And if you say, gee, our part of the network is perfectly healthy, we've been able to validate. We have no problems in our switches, no problems in our route routers uh, just by logging into them and looking at those interfaces, looking at those error counters. You can then say, okay, we've got confirmation that we're running clean. Then we want to end up doing some testing across the MPLS or testing across the carrier's network and validate and say, yes, the problem is in their network. And so that, that troubleshooting methodology should include a rule in of ruling in it's the carrier's problem and rule out of saying we can also confirm it's not our problem. Because sometimes you might be cho uh, chasing two problems at the same time and not realize it. Okay, so... Let, let's get down to brass. What kinds of best practices should our viewers be doing? You know, what kinds of documentation can we do to help the problem? You know, get away from the, let, let's ignore the cables for now, but, you know, what kinds of things should we be documenting? Well, so best start point is have a good network diagram. Know your network. I mean, that know your network of what devices are plugged into what, how is your network connected. Uh, I can tell you the, the first thing as an IT director, when I came into a company, the first thing I would do is say, give me the network diagram. I need to understand this network from start to finish so that I know how it's connected. Once I knew how it's connected, I then logged into each device, each switch, each router, made sure that the logins were working, that I could get into the box, made sure that we had uh, a good inventory of these devices so that we know what comprises our network. And if I found some old 3Com hub, I'd say, okay, that needs to be the first thing that gets off of this network because I don't want to deal with the collisions. The next thing beyond that is, as far as understanding your network, is make sure that you don't have any half duplex links. Seriously, half duplex should be gone from the network. Should have been gone 10 years ago. But it's sad as to how many networks still have a bunch of half duplex links or duplex mismatches that still cause problems for networks that people just don't know about. And if you knew where they were, you'd immediately go solve them and proudly say, I run a collision free network. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times we've had it, it's. It might be perfectly fine gear, but sometimes different brands and different models of switches don't exactly play nice together. So I've had several instances where brand X and brand Y didn't negotiate correctly. And so yeah. sometimes we've actually had to go and hard set the duplex just to get around those. And that was one of the first things we did when we set up Total View in my lab is like, I have that many half duplex devices? Yeah, yeah. I, I hear Neil Allen in my ear saying right now, if you hard set one side to be a, a full duplex, make sure, absolutely sure, you set the other side up to be hard coded full duplex. If you set one side to be full duplex and the other side to be auto, you are guaranteed to end up having a duplex mismatch. So when you go setting things hard, it has to be hard on one side, hard on the other side, get rid of auto. The reason to get rid of auto is auto works in probably 95% of the time, but it's that 5% where it doesn't work, it creates problems. And that 5% is where you're going to have to hard set both ends of the conversation to be full duplex on both sides. Yeah, my other favorite one is, oh, th there's a problem with the patch cable. We just patched it in randomly. 
<laughs> don't, yeah. don't you just love that? <laughs> yeah. In other words, they plugged it into the wrong VLAN. Uh, there's no QoS on that interface. Uh, all sorts of problems. They, they plugged it into a sniffer port. I mean, you, you can't just randomly choose a port and assume unless you're the one who built the network and you know all those ports are on the right VLAN. But, uh, you know, it'd be nice if somebody somewhere made a switch that actually showed the VLAN numbers that were associated with each switch on the front of the port. But I guess that would take yeah. too much space on the front. Yeah, well, I tell you what, what we probably ought to do is go and summarize this segment. You know, what kinds of things, you know, what we we know what it sounds like because it sounds like vowels or syllables are missing. Typically, we've got packet loss, maybe some out of order packets. Um, why don't we go and do a quick summary and maybe throw out some uh, good resources for people that they might want to use to help with their network? Okay, so again, clipping and drops, it's packet loss. Uh, it can also be out of order packets. But uh, typically, you're trying to find out where are these packets going missing. Uh, if you have QoS, enable it. There's many organizations, they don't have QoS enabled. Really, if you have any links that have any sort of bandwidth contention, even you know, you're hitting 50% utilization on your WAN link, put QoS in place. It's going to help make voice a lot better. Uh, people think that, oh, I have gobs of bandwidth. I don't need QoS. Not necessarily. Uh, so QoS will be helpful in all those circumstances. And then just know your network, know where you're dropping the packets, know why you're dropping the packets. Um, and then if you're interested in learning more about solving voice quality problems, uh, you can go ahead and visit our website. We have some great blog entries, uh, www.pathsolutions.com. And our blog talks all about how to solve call quality problems without buying our product. But uh, it, it's really to help educate folks so that you can solve these sort of problems on your own and if you need help, then you can reach out to us and we can offer some tools that will help make things easier. You know, I think I'm going to throw out one more. I think it's document, you know, document your network because it's going to be that one switch that's off under someone's desk or something that's going to be your problem child. And if you don't know about it, it's going to bite you in the butt. Yeah, yeah. I forgot about that, but you're right. It's the switch hidden under someone's desk. is uh, it, It's always the one causing the spanning tree loop or uh, causing collisions in the network or just, oh, I just thought it'd be innocent to plug it in. And it's like, no, <laughs> bad idea. Yeah. Well, you know what? This was the segment 2A, solving VoIP and unified communications drops and clipping problems. Next time... Well, the next one, we're going to go and start looking at how to solve echo problems in segment 2B. But this has been Chibert, Brian Chi. I am ADVNETLAB on Twitter and love to hear from you. And this has been a Twilight Afternoon Special on Solving Voice Over IP Problems. Mm -hmm.